Hello everyone, Kevin Carrillo here, and welcome to another episode of the Cannabinoid Connect Podcast. My guest today is Sam Ariano, CMO of Candescent. Sam Ariano, how are you, sir? Good morning. I am well. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Um, where are you located? Uh, I am speaking to you from uh, sunny Los Angeles this morning. Sunny Los Angeles, man. Yeah, all these, all these guests I have from the uh, the West Coast in California. I'm so jealous. You know, it's the weather's starting to change here in Dallas, getting colder, but um, you know, there's holidays coming, so that's good. But y'all, y'all have great weather year round, man. Perfect place for planting cannabis too, right? <laughs> um, it, it could be much worse. Yeah, I'm very grateful. Very grateful. Awesome. Well, hey, for those listening, as I mentioned, we have Sam Ariano on. He's the CMO of Candescent. Uh, which leads the cannabis industry in innovation and empowers adults to turn down the noise and unlock the moment and transformation their lives with ultra premium cannabis products. So that's the boilerplate, Sam. We obviously want to get into Candescent um, and talk about different things, but let's first um, allow the audience to get to know a little bit about your background. Um, so tell us a little bit about, um, you know, your your professional career and how you transitioned into cannabis? Yeah, so uh, a little bit of background on, on me. Um, I grew up here in Los Angeles um, and uh, by the beach and uh, was really sort of uh, exposed to kind of health and wellness at an early age as a lot of Southern California people stereotypically are. Um, for me, at a young age, that included, uh, you know, athletics and sports. It wasn't so much team sports, but more like surfing and skateboarding and snowboarding, um, things uh, sometimes associated with Southern California. And so uh, growing up that way afforded me a lot of opportunity. Um, it's really, you know, growing up through, yep. Yep, Kevin, go ahead. <laughs> one, question, one question is, okay, so I grew up in New Mexico where there's no water. So when you say in sports and surfing, did like high schools have surfing teams? Yes, they do. Wow. Okay, so that's new to me. I mean, that's probably not surprising to most people who are, live close to California or in Colorado, uh, California, but that is insane. So what are they kind of, what's, what's the competition? Is it, it's not, ra is it racing? Is it tricks? Uh, no, so uh, high schools will compete against other high schools, coastal high schools, and then that that bubbles up to a state level, and then ultimately a national level. And uh, if a quick Google search will will show that uh, in the Olympics that were supposed to happen, the Summer Olympics that were supposed to happen um, this past uh, summer, but but kind of obviously because of the pandemic, surfing will actually be Olympic uh, sport for the first time ever. So pretty wow. amazing. Wow. Now, uh, to be to be clear, I, I, absolutely, I absolutely wasn't on that level. <laughs> I just kind of grew up doing those things. Gotcha. Okay, well, thank you for clarifying that. New information. So, so, yeah, it's, it really, it really kind of just sets the backdrop for my professional career. Um, it, it wasn't actually through surfing, although we've spent some time talking about surfing. It was actually through cycling that I, uh, that I gained uh, some exposure into marketing and then through uh, a, a bicycle company and then, um, you know, got a, got a position there, entry level position as a, as a young person. Uh, have more or less been a, a career marketing specialist ever since with stints. Uh, entrepreneurial stints kind of split in between. I owned a brand design agency for several years, got to work with uh, a lot of amazing uh, best in class uh, category leading brands like Nike, Red Bull, Incase, uh, among others. Uh, had a, a stint in um, men's contemporary apparel as well. Uh, so when you when you do agency work, you 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 get some familiarity in a lot of different areas. Some of which was food and beverage, some of which was health and wellness. Um, so 
pretty colorful, pretty diverse background between working with big companies and or owning businesses. Uh, there was a time in there where I owned retail as well. So, uh, but now I'm here at Candescent and uh, loving every minute of being in the cannabis industry. Yeah, well, so that let's back up a bit. So you mentioned the the surfing and the cycling, and then you you know you kind of um, gravitated toward that that marketing uh, career role where you owned your own brand designed agency, right? And and as a agency mm -hmm. owner myself, I can totally relate in that it's it's very awesome that you can work with so many different clients in different industries, right? Big or small. Um, real estate versus construction versus, you know, whatever it is, right? Uh, cannabis. And so um, that's, that's really great. And so did you always, were you a user of cannabis? Were you an advocate? Or did you just see this industry t start to take off in the early 2000s in California? And you thought, I'm jumping in or? No, uh, quite the opposite, actually. Um, growing up, I wasn't, uh, I wouldn't say I was a, a regular user. Um, I certainly experimented in high school, um, things of that nature, but it wasn't a big part of my lifestyle. Um, how I arrived at Candescent, interestingly, I think it's a, it's, it's a, it's a story worth noting. So um, I mentioned Nike somewhere in this conversation about doing some, uh, we had some, at my agency, we had a, there, there were a retained account. And so we were working uh, heavily with the Portland office and the Los Angeles office. And it was, it was, it was through what I'll call the, the unofficial Nike alumni network that I arrived at Candescent because at the time, uh, the person who sort of uh, held the seat that I have, the chief marketing officer here, uh, prior to me, she was here on contract interim basis and, and she had asked me to come aboard to do some consulting. Um, and then long story short, she ended up getting pregnant uh, by her husband, you know, by design. And, uh, she asked me to, she thought I would, I would be a perfect fit here. Um, and that was about uh, 16 months ago. And as I said earlier, loving every minute. So uh, I, I kind of paraphrase or summarize that by saying I didn't necessarily go looking for cannabis. Cannabis uh, found me. Right. No, that's a beautiful story. And, you know, I always ask this question to my guests, um, especially those have, who have come from other industries into cannabis. And that is, what was the... Uh, you know, what was the feedback and the response you got from some of your other industry peers or even some of your clients that you worked with? Um, how did they react? Um, overwhelmingly positive. So many people who had uh, an association with flower or the plant, um, people that I didn't know had an association or an appreciation rather uh, for flower kind of came out of the woodworks and, and were like, wow, like this is amazing. You know, we think this is, you know, tremendous growth opportunity within the industry or um, that sector. Uh, and so I was, I was very well pleased um, with that response from some friends and colleagues. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lovely place to be. Um, and it's one of the things that I, I think about, one of the things I'm very grateful for when I think about the business that we currently operate in, um, one of the many things that I'm grateful for is uh, in so many industries where I was um, either consulting or was part of the executive team, there was always this sense of uh, Amazon is not far behind. And uh, one of the things, uh, if you're selling widgets, uh, whatever they may be, uh, apparel, stainless steel water bottles, uh, tech wearables, whatever they may be, uh, it's likely that Amazon has a play at some point uh, along that sort of uh, sort of maturation process. So, so you're constantly trying to, to, you know, trying to figure out how you're going to navigate, uh, you know, some of that stickiness, and um, that's not the case with cannabis. Right, and that, I mean, part of the reason is because it's so new, right? I mean, we're we're literally at the forefront of uh, of this industry on a nationwide scale, right? So. Um, it's just an exciting time to be in it. And I ask about that, that perception question when you transitioned in, 
uh, just because I know for others have, have, you know, had gotten some back backlash and this was years ago, not, not as of recent, which we know there's more growing support than ever with, you know, the five States passing, uh, for four of which for adult use and five for, uh, or the other one for medicinal. So, um, but my, my point is, is that when I did this, even when I transitioned from the B2B tech side, you know, to hear it was there was some hesitation at first you know i didn't know what people would think and whatnot and and this was just literally during the pandemic i mean um i had gotten laid off due to covid and so i thought you know i'd been an advocate and a user for years and i thought now's the time to really kind of hone in on some of my skill set and and you know bring people on like yourselves who who are experts and and are you know on the front lines with this plant and operating businesses to really educate and inform people regarding the benefits. Um, so it's, all, it's really all about, you know, just awareness and, and education. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, the, the perception or the idea of the perception of, um, you know, stigma associated with, with the plant was not lost on me when I, <laughs> when I transitioned, which is kind of an interesting way to put it. But, um, yeah, it was it was something my wife and I talked about. It was not not necessarily an industry that we were looking to tap into, um, but I'm so very fortunate um, that we made the decision that we did, and um, we have a slightly different relationship with flower now, uh, being that Candescent is a vertically integrated uh, manufacturer and cultivator. So uh, we're enjoying the benefits of that, uh, to be clear, and. Uh, yeah, you, you bring up a good point. It, it is early days, and I think there is uh, a sense of fervor and excitement, um, enthusiasm that collectively the industry shares, the legalized industry shares together. So, um, look, it's it's a great time to be in cannabis. Amen to that. Yeah, and, you know, I, I want to switch gears and talk about something that's really important, especially when we kind of touched on um, this this emergence of growing public support for for cannabis legalization and and how you know um, during COVID there were businesses that were deemed essential and so on. But you know there is also this dark factor um, that that needs to be addressed. And I know that uh, Candescent is is addressing that through their Justice Joints initiative. But um, for those that are unaware, you know there are people serving sentences for cannabis related charges, uh, and they've forced to watch these business these you know businesses being deemed essential and and a, and a cannabis industry that's thriving right now we see more public support for different states legalization so um but these people are still being punished for things that they were they did years ago and now you know it's, it's okay so um i really like this this program that you have justice joints why don't you talk a little bit about that and what you're doing to address this uh, social uh, in inequity that's going on <clears throat> Yeah, Kevin, thank you for, for bringing up Justice Joints. So a um, little, little background <clears throat> before we get into Justice Joints, or JJ as we affectionately refer to it. Um, Candescent is a, uh, is a house of brands, or we think of our organization from an enterprise level as a house of brands. Candescent, as many of your listeners will uh, presumably know, is a category leading ultra premium uh, flower here in California. We have a, uh, a mid-tier brand, I think when you're thinking from a, a dispensary's perspective, that's good brands. That's our, our mixed light, sun-grown, uh, pesticide-free, uh, pure, wholesome uh, um, flower brand, pre-rolls, eights, that sort of thing. Um, at the start of the pandemic, we launched a value brand, which is called Baker's. Um, so that's about five months old now. Um, that's for the everyday uh, consumer of cannabis, providing them accessible price points at uh, volume weights that uh, make sense for their lives. And then, as you pointed out, and, the, and, and what I'm alluding to or going to get to now is, is Justice Joints, which is um, our fourth brand. And the brand that we... Uh, took time over the summer. What I mean by taking time is um, it's not lost on anybody. Sort of the the inequities that you know sort of belie the industry long before any kind of a unrest. I mean we've got generational growers. We've got people who are incarcerated for nonviolent uh, 
uh, cannabis related crimes, uh, you know, serving time for things that we actually um, can do here in California legally. So um, that time that I'm referring to over the summer was um, when things were going down with police brutality, um, kind of merging what was happening from uh, social injustices. And there was a lot of, there was a lot being asked of cannabis companies, right? There were, you know, what's, what's our position? What's our role? How are we going to be a part of the solution? Um, creating the change that we hope to see in the world, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, you know, the development, the idea uh, for Justice Joints wasn't something that we were uh, incubating prior to the summer. It was, it, it actually very much is the result of a deep introspection at, at sort of founder level, uh, executive team level. We wanted to do something that we felt was uniquely uh, candescent, and that is that we would create something that was sustainable, uh, freestanding, and was not a um, uh, motivated by a mo moment in time. We 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 saw these 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 issues of uh, social equity or lack thereof, um, expungement, um, clean record release, reentry programs. We saw these as very foundational systemic problems that that we needed a solution for. Uh, for the near term or, or the long term, depending. So uh, we devised a plan to create our fourth brand justice joints where 100% of our profits go directly to these causes. Uh, we were fortunate to uh, find a partner in the Last Prisoner Project um, where we're donating those funds to um, help those still incarcerated, those still behind bars for nonviolent cannabis related crimes. Um, so, so, you know, it's, it's about expunging records and it's about helping them get, um, you know, successful reentry back into, uh, back into society. So we, we couldn't be more proud. Um, Justice just launched last week. The reception has been uh, humbling, I'll say. Um, industry-wide and we're hoping that it becomes a platform that um, that other cultivators distributors uh, legal license holders can participate in it's not going to be something that's uniquely exclusive to Candesa. Um I think if there was a long-term vision we would spin this off as a 5013 C um, have a d diverse leadership team etc cetera, etc cetera. but um, small acorns right now big trees hopefully in the future Yes, absolutely. And man, I mean, hats off to, to that and, and your efforts there because, and I love how you're making it a community thing and not just solely a candescent, you know, kind of initiative. Um, it just, it broadens the scope. Like you said, other cultivators can participate. There can be uh, this kind of collaboration of uh, really high quality, um, you know, pre-rolls that people can purchase. And then, like you said, a hundred percent of all the profits go straight to uh, the last prisoners project, which, Hey, I mean, that's, that's great. And so um, you mentioned it launched last week, which it's, it's obviously very, it's too soon to kind of tell, you know, our, our release numbers, but we look forward to seeing how much money has been raised. Um, but also what does the last prisoner project plan to do specifically with the funds? So, um, as, as I mentioned, you know, their, their platform is really about expunging records um, and reentry programs. And so, um, the profits that Justice Joints is able to funnel to them will go directly into um, existing programs. Um, you know, there's a variety of ways that they distribute funds, um, a, f a few of which are, you know, um, lobbying. Um, petitioning, fundraising measures, um, things of that nature, and then working with um, with those who are who are up for parole or 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 are now just getting to a place where they're coming back into society, um, and they want uh, a foothold within the legal cannabis industry. I mean, a lot of these these people have tremendous skill sets. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah, and so. Um... You know, last kind of thing I want to touch on here is uh, when do you expect um, things to kind of change, right? I mean, um, 
things are getting better. I would say with more public support, the, the, the cannabis plan itself is becoming more legitimized. But when it comes to social inequity, I mean, we do have a long way to go, but what's the kind of first step we need to take outside of the things that you're doing with Candescent and Justice Joints? Well, I, I think, you know, some of the unrest that, that, uh, that transpired across the country, uh, however it came about, is really just sort of illuminating the problems that have always lied sort of uh, just underneath the surface. So, um, you know, us at Candescent, this, this response is really, um, you know, it, it's, it's as part of our daily sort of gratitude of, of, of thinking that we get to do things that others are still incarcerated and uh, for doing, previously doing. So uh, we'd like to see the industry sort of adopt this, this methodology, this, this understanding of, of um, hey, there, there are brothers and sisters in arms, so to speak, who, who, who need our help and um, for what we get to profit on every day. And so um, as long as we can come you know, with that sort of uh, mindset uh, to offices like this that I'm speaking to you from, um, I think we just need to to prioritize that in our in, in our DNA as an organization. And I'm speaking broadly across the board now. Um, there is no lack of creativity in this industry. I think justice uh, as a platform uh, can turn into uh, you know infused beverages, can turn into flour, can turn into chocolates and edibles, and we can bring on. Um, you know, cross category leaders who, who, who also are looking for ways to contribute, uh, you know, in a, in a long-term sustainable way. Right. So we were, uh, we could have peeled off profits. We've could have done, um, of, of our three other brands, we could have created, you know, special products, but no, we wanted to create a brand and a platform and hopefully a movement and, uh, look, you know, uh, maybe it'll, maybe this model will be replicated elsewhere. Uh, maybe MSOs can take a look at it. Maybe we can license this to MSOs. We're open to these types of conversations um, because we understand the need is so great. Um, and we talked about LPP, the Last Prisoner Project, but I think it's I think it's worth noting that um, we really have two points of view about where these profits are going to be distributed. Last uh, Last Prisoner Project being one of them. The other is going to be sort of within our own backyard from a social equity perspective, right? So. Um, if you take a look at, and maybe you can share on social media, um, the Justice Joints packaging, we're very a fact forward type of brand design where we talk about 100% of profits, 40,000 people still currently incarcerated. One of the things that we also call out is this disparity in here in California of uh, BIPOC communities and their access to licenses, to run dispensaries, that sort of thing. So um, a portion of our profits uh, all profits are going to be donated, LPP being one. Um, the other is going to be something that we develop uh, as a way to give back to social equity award winners, uh, people who want to be a cannabis dispensary. There's a lot of costs associated with legal fees, admin, um, license fees, just to get to a place where then you have to sort of crawl up this mini mountain of um, store design, store build out, um, accessing, you know, um, brands and suppliers, et cetera, et cetera, right? So um, if we can uh, escrow or if we can create a grant program effectively where applicants can come and apply for funds to soften that burden, um, social equity award winning applicants can, can apply, um, we want to give them that, that sort of uh, momentum push, if you will, into the industry. So Justice Joints will be giving back in those two ways. That's great. Yeah. Just to provide that opportunity for, like you said, those, those social equity award winners. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's an opportunity they need. Right. And it's that little push that, that can just help them become more successful. So um, we can't wait to see how, how that evolves and, and where can people purchase uh, these, these uh, justice joints? So uh, as I mentioned, justice is just now distributing last week was our first week. I think we have about, 20 accounts here in California. Um, we're looking to scale that up to 200 plus accounts over the next three, six months. So uh, I would just encourage anybody listening, 
um, who want to be able to contribute. Um, we like to say spark change with the cannabis you consume, right? Knowing that, um, hey, you're in the market for uh, you know a pre-roll that's under 10 bucks. Um, why not buy a justice joint and feel good about sparking change, right? So um, I would just encourage anybody listening who's interested in participating with their dollars, their voting dollars, um, that they go to their local dispensary and just ask, uh, when will you have justice joints? It's, uh, it's our hope and it's our intent that this will be uh, the most widely distributed brand throughout California and then ultimately uh, the United States. Absolutely. Yeah. And please send me anything that, uh, that we can blast out on social media to help you guys. Cause this is a really great cause. So. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, Kevin. I, I really do. Um, your listeners can go on to justicejoints.co to learn more about what we're doing and how we're distributing funds and they can follow us for, for regular updates, uh, at justice joints on Instagram and any social media platform. Awesome. Well, thank you again for sharing all that, Sam. Um, I, I want to talk now about, you know, the elephant in the room. Obviously, COVID-19 has been a, a big hit, uh, not just on the cannabis industry, but everybody basically in the world, uh, the pandemic. And so I want to talk to you about how COVID-19 has impacted uh, Candescent's business and what y'all have had to do to kind of pivot to, uh, to, mitig to migrate through these, these issues. Yeah, so... Um, I mentioned earlier, you know, we're vertically integrated, which means we, uh, Candescent has um, indoor grows, mixed light grows, um, and in some ways, um, you know, Candescent is, is an in innovator uh, uh, and, and creator of FIRST, right? So we were the first uh, California municipally permitted, um, I always kind of stumble across this, we were the first municipally permitted uh, legal grow in uh, Desert Hot Springs, um, which is just outside Palm Springs. Um, where I'm going with this is the first thing was um, we had to protect our people, right? So we have uh, upwards of about 200 people working in our cultivation facilities out in Desert Hot Springs. And, and we had to take all the necessary CDC protocols just to ensure that we can still operate. You know, I think you mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, cannabis was deemed essential so uh, first was to, to kind of protect our people, making sure we're following all the protocols, um, stations that, that directly impacted uh, operations, processing, because now we're social distancing, um, you know, operational space was spread out um, and, and we're very con confined because uh, our, our grow is growing, no pun intended. Um, so I, I think we look at it from, from a couple of different perspectives is, is like, how are we going to protect our people so that we can stay in business? And then, um, you know, what is it that we can do to, um, you know, help our customers um, sort of in this, in this new normal, right? And I, I think from a marketing perspective, you know, the area that I have, uh, you know, sort of specialized expertise in, it was really about um, changing some of our sort of uh, operating MO. Um, we were already migrating towards digital. We had a sort of uh, a long-term vision and perspective on, uh, you know, direct to consumer um, and ultimately delivery. And so we were, we were thinking about that. So I, I guess I would say from a marketing perspective, COVID uh, accelerated some of those efforts. Um, we're not yet where we need to be, but, but certainly uh, making sure that we were putting our customers in a position to have the assets, the digitized assets they need so that they can reach out to the local constituencies, making sure that um, you know, they were no longer seeing our sales reps uh, you know, at the height, you know, of, of earlier in the pandemic, I, I should, I should say. Um, so we had to kind of digitize some of our trainings, uh, brand education, um, things of that nature, of which I think we did very effectively, um, through third party apps and other, other applications, but we really just had to focus our efforts, um, you know, offline, online, pick up curbside delivery, um, so sort of tectonic shift there, but again, we were already migrating in that area. Um, and it was really about being agile. It was really about, you know, kind of making some pivots and, um, getting to it. And, 
I can tell you that I'm very proud of my team that they were able to do that. I think being deemed essential was uh, very gratifying. We're very grateful for that, obviously, um, in light of all of the hardships that you know we still feel today. Yeah. No, I mean, no doubt about it. It's like there's been so much that that's gone gone on this year, and it's it's easy to dwell on all the all the negative that's happened. But you know, it's it's also important to look at the positive outcomes, and one of which is how you said. I mean, inevitably, y'all were migrating over to being more digital, digitally focused, but you know, with the pandemic, it just accelerated that. And it, it kind of mm-hmm. kicked everyone in the butt to kind of make that, that pivot. And so um, how do you feel like operations are running now, now that we're in uh, November? I mean, is it p- pretty, pretty smooth at this point? Or is there still some uh, adjustments that are, that are being made? Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm probably not the guy who will say things were, uh, you know, optimal or, or running smoothly. I'm kind of more the guy that says we're, we're constantly refining and tweaking and, and looking to optimize. So categorically, that's my, that's my position. Um, but, you know, we're, we're seeing an equal response within our retail network as well. You know, um, there's nobody sort of operating in isolation here, right? So brands are making an adjustment. Um, our customers in this instance are making adjustment. Uh, consumers have an expectation um, in terms of access. So it's, uh, you know, collectively, um, I think everybody's sort of acumen and, and, and interest and curiosity um, to get better in the digital sort of environment is, is happening simultaneously, which is also fun and exciting. Um, sometimes, you know, our customers are, are, are bringing creative ideas and solutions to us and, and, and very often it's us bringing those to them as well. So um, in, in that regard, the industry is still very, very young. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's fun to grow together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're all kind of in this together and we're all trying to figure it out. <laughs> so, um, you know, one thing I want to touch on is, is marketing now and uh, you being the CMO of Candescent. Um, talk to me about how you approach marketing uh, such a diverse brand architecture to various demographics, right? I'm sure that, I mean, you mentioned uh, good brands, Baker's Cannabis Code, and then we talked about Justice Joints. So obviously each of those brands probably have different demographics that you're targeting. So how do you kind of navigate through that architecture? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, multi-brand strategy is not, uh, is not something that I would necessarily uh, encourage those sort of faint of heart, right? So, um, and that's, that's just another way of saying it's, it's challenging managing one brand um, very well, uh, much less four now. So, um, but look, you know, the reason for being with our multi-brand strategy is that we, um, we have no compromises sort of within, unilaterally within each of our four brands. Um, Candescent doesn't have to acquiesce in any way, right? We are unapologetically uh, of the opinion that Candescent is not for everybody, right? If you like high potency indoor flower and are willing to pay for that high quality sort of user experience in ultra premium, um, then we have a product for you and and we'd like to have a conversation with you. And that's Candescent, right? So uh, very high end. It might not be right for um, someone who's looking for more bang for their buck um, on a daily basis, though I might be able to argue that uh, both ways. And then good brands, that, that's, that's somebody who's looking for um, you know, a slightly different turf profile or cannabinoid profile. Um, you know, they, they like outdoor, they like you know, mixed light or light depth, and, and then on and on and on. And so you know, the brand architecture that you talked about is we're sort of unequivocal, right? We say candescent is this, um, good is that. And we, we, we create these in a way, not only for the user experience, but you know, our understanding of uh, that consumer set, right? So it, it, in some ways it's, you know, it kind of goes back to, to 
you know, branding 101 or just kind of what you might learned in school, your listeners might have learned in school is really, there is no substitute for knowing your audience. There is no substitute for knowing their, um, their use cases, um, what they like, what they don't like, how cannabis fits into their lifestyle, um, et cetera, et cetera. We try to attune our brand architecture for that. And so um, I hope that answers your question. Well, yeah. so you say you attune it to that particular audience or demographic. Does that mean that you start with the product and, and its branding and the way in which you're presenting it and, and the messaging behind it? And then you kind of target that demographic based on the branding or does the branding evolve as you start to see a specific or, or particular demographic gravitating toward that product? I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's the inverse or the exact opposite. We start with a, a, a problem that we see in the marketplace and we provide, try to provide a creative solution. And so do we, we kind of attune um, our point of view with a perceived customer set or consumer set, um, and we try to provide them a uh, solution to you know whatever perceived problem that we understand, whether it's um, you know like bakers, it was making price points readily accessible for those who you know we accelerated the launch of bakers um, at the start of COVID. It was originally planned for Q3, but we felt as though there were so many people who were within our um, sort of brand design, uh, that audience who were being disproportionately impacted, these are hourly workers, et cetera, et cetera, by furloughs and layoffs. And we said, you know what, this is a, this is a solution we can provide our customers so they can get more accessible price points on shelf so that those people who were, um, you know, kind of struggling, they could, they could buy something that they could actually afford. So um, that's, that's, that's a way of saying, you know, we knew who we wanted to serve and at the same time um, that brands do evolve, right? So that was a part of your question. Brands do evolve um, within a certain sort of um, elasticity, I like to call it, but we stay true to our true north for each one. Sure. And with staying true to that true north for each brand and as you're, you know, interacting with these different audiences, is there a, is there a, a difference in education levels when it comes to the understanding of the cannabis plant among these different demographics or is it pretty much great question great great question absolutely absolutely so um just like you might find in a sort of a, a queuing up at a dispenser here in california you, you're going to have someone who's who's young and old and um, new and versed and initiated and uninitiated, however you like to say it, right? And you, you might have, you might be standing by, behind a gentleman or, or a woman who has a generational, you know, sort of user experience and understanding and can recite, you know, a hundred different types of multivariate strains, right? And, and you would never know that just by looking at her, but, but she comes from a family or she's just whatever her unique situation is. And so our brands have to be sensitive to that, right? So we think about Candescent as, as, as a, a very forward, contemporary, uh, directional brand that is none like not unlike what you would find, you know, uh, in luxury goods, whether it's, uh, you know, textiles, apparel, fashion, uh, beverage. Um, and, and, you know, with that, there's a, a measure of education. You know, Candescent is, uh, is sort of the author of the effect-based architecture. You know, we ask consumers, how do you want to feel, rather than what type of strain are you looking for, right? So there is, there is a, uh, a very sort of direct point of view of like, if you can answer the question from a candescent perspective of how you want to feel, we have an effect for you, right? So candescent sells, calm, cruise, create, connect, and charge. That's our 5C effect-based architecture. So if you're looking to cruise, um, we got you covered. If you're looking to connect, create, et cetera, et cetera. Where Baker's is quite different, right? Uh, an everyday user is going to have a much greater familiarity, in our opinion, of those multivariant strains and the hybrids and kind of uh, can curate ex an experience uh, slightly differently. Got you. Okay, yeah. So you really do kind of think through from end to end, not just in your branding and positioning to the, the audience, but then also understanding their needs and what they're looking for to cater and provide them with that, that right product. Absolutely. hundred percent. That's great. 
Well, that's awesome. And Sam, you know, I, I want to just touch on this last thing here is what, what are your future industry predictions and, uh, and some of the priorities that Candestin has set um, in 2021? Well, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't know if I'm the right person for predictions, but uh, I have my, I have my feelings about, um, you know, directionally where the industry is going to grow and go, grow and go. Um, look, you know, with, with uh, four new states approving REC just this week, um, it, it's going to add about six. I think those more, much more educated than me, I think have estimated it's going to add about six billion dollars to the top line um, when you look at uh, cannabis as a growth industry here, uh, pre pre legalization, pre uh, you know descheduling. So um, that's a that's a tremendous a tremendous thing for those of us who are working and fortunate enough to work in the cannabis industry. So um, there's, I, I would say that's, a, that's a bit of a bellwether, a telltale sign. Um, Destigmatization, it seems to be, you know, rapidly eroding, as you pointed out, um, many more people of variety, variety of demographics, wide varying demographics, um, are becoming more and more comfortable with the with the goodness and the plant, uh, you know, sort of inherent qualities of for health and wellness, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, look, I, I I'm so fortunate to say this. You know, I, I just think it's really, really sky's the limit. I think um, I think what's going to happen over the course of the next five to seven years um, it will be profound. Certainly, we're we're sort of uh, in the prohibition sort of period, but uh, it won't last forever, and um, I'm I'm just happy that that we as an industry are are taking this this moment in time to kind of address these these systemic challenges and problems that we've had from a social equity perspective, um, and that's a part of this growth trajectory that we're on. And so, um, yeah, I couldn't be more bullish on it. Yeah, no, it, it you're exactly right, and it it is it, the responsibility falls on on us in the industry to to you know undo those wrongs, and uh, it's it's really great again what Candescence doing when it comes to those justice joints and and making it a collaborative effort within the industry to to help those those people. So, Sam, um, I really appreciate your time today. It's been a pleasure talking with you. And um, is there anything you want to leave the audience with before we, before we uh, sign off here? No, Kevin, I just want to thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure um, um, for your listeners. Again, I just encourage you to go to justicejoints.co or follow us at justicejoints on Instagram for updates. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, that's it. I mean, help us spark change, you know, share, share our posts, um, you know, reach out to your dispensaries, ask for justice joints by name, um, take action and uh, help be a part of the solution with your voting dollars. So I appreciate your time as well. Thanks, Kevin. Absolutely. And thank you all for listening. Talk to you later. Bye. Mm -hmm.